Hello everyone, I'm Zahid from Talk Search Innovation Valley and today we have very amazing guests with us. You know, we bring the global leaders from around the globe. So today is a very, very special guest, Mark Sparvel. Mark is a global award-winning educator and leader with 30 years of experience supporting education transformation. Mark currently is an education director with Microsoft and passionate about the role technology plays in humanizing learning. Mark is a recognized expert in social and emotional uh, and is a burst speaker, podcaster, and writer on all topics education related to the education. So first of all, I really warm welcome you, Mark, on the podcast of Talks at Innovation Valley. Great. Thanks, Sahid. I'm delighted to be here and an opportunity to talk about all things education. You are welcome, Mark. Mark, you know, today our topic is how to use AI for education wisely. But before we jump to the topic and questions, my audience and I would love to know about your educational, professional story, how, from where you got your education and when you started your first job and then how you got to the Microsoft and all this, you know, educational stuff. So how was all this entrepreneurial journey. Right. I, I love that. And all that stuff. Uh, I mean, I'm a, uh, you know, I'm a grandfather of two. So my journey to this point in time stretches back many, many, many decades. Um, most of my education was completed in Australia. Um, and it was within Australia that I, I began my teaching career, initially starting off curiously working in a bank before deciding I needed something that was maybe a little bit more creative for me. I think for me, I've always been curious. And uh, as I became interested in pursuing another career outside of being an accountant in a bank, I wanted to follow a career path that would allow me to explore my curiosity about lots of different topics. And education seemed to be the ideal uh, avenue for me. I think one thing really interesting happened quite early on in my career in education, and that was on my very first day of teaching, the deputy principal of the school I'd been placed at came up to me and asked me, did I know anything about computers? Because a whole bunch of Commodore 64 computers had arrived at this school months before I'd arrived at the school, and nobody knew what could be done with them. And I remember saying to the deputy, Adrian Leo was his name, oh, yeah, I, I know about Commodore 64s. I could teach the kids how to program in Logo and program in BASIC. And instantly I became the computer teacher. I was literally in my first few months of teaching. So for me, my career with leadership education leadership has been tied to a technology agenda. And as the technology has changed and evolved, my use of it has changed and evolved too. If And just briefly, we fast forward from that experience, a beginning teacher being introduced as the brand new computer teacher, never had one before. And then we fast forward a few years later, I find myself on a boat in the body of ocean that separates South Australia from Kangaroo Island. I've got a, a netbook with a dongle connected to the internet and we're dragging behind this boat a hydrophone. It's a microphone that listens underwater. And I've got students all around Australia and from museums listening to the bottlenose dolphins chattering to one another beneath the water. And again, this was a long time before everybody had internet on their phones. But I've always been curious, as I said at the start, I've been curious, how do we take and leave a technology and use it to give students experiences and opportunities and perspectives of the world around them? All right. Mark, very, very interesting and inspirational journey. So happy to know that. Mark, uh, you know, for the educators, can you please 
give an easy definition of artificial intelligence for the educators what is really artificial intelligence and why we need to use it for the education yeah and that's a big question uh, it's a big question because intelligence itself is actually very hard to define let alone artificial intelligence but one way of explaining that is to maybe go back in time just a little bit artificial intelligence has been around since the 1950s you know it's not a new thing that appeared with chat gpt in november of 2022 it's been around since 1950s as a field of computer science um, and it sought to, if you like, create intelligent machines that could replicate or even exceed human intelligence. Then into the 1950s, 60s, machine learning, and these are, this is all part of AI, machine learning was introduced and that was a part of artificial intelligence that allowed machines to make sense of existing data, make predictions, uh, or make decisions based upon data. In the kind of 2017, 2015, we had deep learning. So this is the development of artificial intelligence from AI, machine learning. In 2017, deep learning, and this was, I guess, you, using more brain-like functions to make decisions. And of course, 2021, another subset, generative AI, which is the one most people are talking about now, which is the ability of technology to, to create written visual auditory content given prompts and existing data sets. So these are all around uh, exhibiting intelligent-like behaviours, being able to predict, being able to analyse, being able to sense-make um, and when we think about just computers generally, for 70 years, we've been trying to pursue sort of a better interface between humans and computers, right? We, we developed, you know, Microsoft developed Windows as a, a way of looking at your computer. Before that, we had just basic command prompts. That wasn't very human. It's much more human to see a window and pretty little icons that you can move and control. And then think about it. Things like the mouse were introduced, much more human to move it around. And the keyboard, much more human. And then digital inking, that's very human. It's a good way to interact. Or when I talk to Cortana or Alexa or whatever my digital assistant is, that's very human. It's no surprising that the next big logical leap between how humans and computers interact and collaborate is around natural language. And that's what this current wave of generative AI is all about. It's about natural language interactions between humans and technology um, as a way of generating content, as a way of engaging as a way of receiving support as a way of accessing if you like a reasoning engine that can sit on top of a huge amount of data and reason with it sense make from it providing the human is always in the loop prompting with the right kinds of questions all right uh mark what are some of the current applications of AI in the education sector and how are they positively impacting the learning process? Yep, great question. And it certainly, as I was saying at the start, I've just recently come back from talking a lot about AI in education at ISTE. Uh, ISTE is one of the largest ed tech conferences in the US. And it would be fair to say all topics were dominated by AI and how can it be used to best support learners? How can it be used to best support teachers in their work? A quick comment before I jump into some, some answers there would be, it's the rate of change with generative AI that's exciting and also it's challenging, right? I mean, think about this, the time to reach 100 million users for 
mobile phones was 16 years. The internet, it took seven years to get to 100 million users. Facebook or Meta, it took four and a half years to get to 100 million users. Chat GPT, when it was released, it took three months to reach 100 million users. And educators have been absolutely fascinated by this technology. And the reason I think it is, is because as a teacher myself, and part of the education profession, asking questions and prompting is kind of our core business. That's what teachers do. We ask questions of students and then we prompt them and we prompt them again to get to like the deep learning and the right understanding. And I think that's why many educators have naturally found themselves using generative AI because they're quite used to asking questions and prompting. Now, you asked the question in terms of some of the, the promising examples. Uh, I can give a, a, a few examples here, some really exciting ones um, around the use of generative AI specifically. Um, so he, here's a quick example, which I did a live demo of at ISTE, a very simple demonstration. I, I used um, the search engine Bing. So I went to Bing dot com forward slash chat it's using this the similar algorithm to chat gpt 4.0 but it has the benefit of pulling from the internet not just pulling from a a body of language it's been trained on and with an audience in front of me i did this um i did this demo where i i typed in saying i'm a grade four teacher um can you create for me a 10 question quiz, which is all about the correct use of commas and provide instructions, provide multiple choice answers, and please provide an answer key for me, enter. As the audience watched, what the bing.com chat did was it went out and it pulled from a whole bunch of resources online and then it generated an authentic and original quiz for me to use. Here are the instructions. Here are the 10 questions. There's an incorrect comma in each one. Here's a description of where the comma should be and why. Here's the answer key. A as an educator, I'm like, oh, yeah, thank you. That is saving me a huge amount of time. Another quick example, which uh, I've seen teachers use, is they've taken their comments that they've written in the student's end of semester or end of year report where a teacher normally spends a lot of time writing a, a personal comment. They've written their comments and then they've taken them all, they've put them into a generative AI tool and they've simply said, could you please rewrite these to make them more fluent, more grammatically correct, more positive? And then they watch as their comments are edited by the generative AI and the teacher then can make that decision whether they wish to keep um, those edited versions. It's like having a, again, it's like having a reasoning engine that allows us to start with a draft. And that's where I see educators getting really excited and creative. Another quick example, um, trying to make a lesson more engaging. So let's say the students have been studying a historical character of studying William Shakespeare. Instead of just reading The Tempest or reading the book, they can say to generative AI, generative AI, you are now William Shakespeare. I want to chat with you about your life and your work. The generative AI instantly says, hello, I'm William Shakespeare. What would you like to know? And I say, well, I'm in and the conversation goes. So not only can you obviously generate content, but you can have dialogue. And this is where it's really exciting for learners and teachers, creating content, having dialogue. You could say to the generative AI, I'd like to practice my Spanish. Can we chat in Spanish? The prompt will come up saying, hola, como estas? And you'll type, and for a student, it's like having a tutor um, on any possible topic. For an educator, 
It's like having a paraprofessional riding shotgun. Again, the human in the loop is the critical thing here. The teacher has control. The teacher should always be able to edit. I could give you another five amazing examples of how generative AI is being built into existing tools. I'll give you a couple and then you can stop me when you've had enough. Um, one of the things that takes teachers a lot of time is what we call running records. It involves listening to a student read and paying attention to miscues, omissions, errors, pace, intonation, and we score and rank those. And then we use that information to help us um, adapt a reading program to, to support Zahid, to make him more fluent, to understand where he reads more. Pretty important stuff, right? What AI can do now, we've built inside of a tool called Reading Coach, Reading Progress. It's part of Microsoft's Learning Accelerators. Is Reading Coach and Progress will get the student to read to the computer screen. It will watch them and listen to them. It knows the text, okay, as well. And at the end of it, it will provide the student and the teacher with a report around what words they missed, what were their challenge words, what was their pace like, and so on. That's awesome. But with generative AI now sitting behind it, what the tool does is it takes those challenge words and it generates an original piece of content, an original new piece of practice writing for the student to read. Now, the teacher can adjust it by complexity of words, by length, even by topic. The teacher could say, look, I want this new piece of writing for Zahid to have a space theme. But what you receive, Zahid, as your assignment is this brand new piece of text written just for you with the words that you've struggled with for you to practice and repeat. Plus also, the same tool now has got generative AI producing comprehension questions. So it will read the piece of writing, understand what the content is, and it will generate questions for you to make sure that you're reading for meaning, not just for fluency. Now, that's a little example of how generative AI is being folded inside of Microsoft's learning accelerators, and they're completely free for people that have got education institutions that have got Microsoft Teams. Honestly, it's like having 20 extra teachers in the classroom. And that is a good example of how generative AI can be used to support learners to develop foundational skills like literacy. Uh, super amazing. And I'm sure exciting things are going to happen. And I'm sure students are going to learn a lot with this. And the students right now are lucky enough that they have the tools like generative AI and, you know. So uh, Mark, as AI becomes more prevalent in education, what are some potential challenges or concerns that educators and students might face? You know, let me add something more. Mm -hmm. Many people around the world, they are afraid of AI. They say like, AI will disturb the learning process. AI will do this. AI will do that harm. What is your opinion on all this? Yeah, I, I think they're fair concerns when we're faced with any disruption. You know, any disruption will bring opportunities and it will bring challenges. Um, and we see governments um, and education ministries at the moment starting to come out with, um, with guidance for their schools and systems to consider as they start developing and deploying. Um, the US Department of Education released a report titled AI and the Future of Teaching and Learning recently, Insights and Recommendations, which calls out what some of those concerns are. You know, concerns around, you know, is this the death of creative, creative thought? You know, concerns around cheating and plagiarism. But then there are other concerns that people need to have top of mind when they're using any form of artificial intelligence that has been trained on, 
you know, a set of data. That's things like algorithm bias, you know, uh, depending upon how the tool has been developed and the safeguards that have been built around that, you know, there certainly can be bias within the tool, which, you know, could can be, uh, you know, quite concerning. So trust, safety uh, are key issues. You know, what are the guardrails that are around? This is why, um, you know, when I look at, say, the work that Microsoft leads in AI broadly and our current work in generative AI, all of our work is underpinned by a set of principles um, which guide the work that we do and also the development of the tools that other people use of ours, which is Azure OpenAI, being used by many uh, businesses to develop their AI capabilities. Um, so our principles matter a lot to us and they're around fairness. You know, is this good for everybody? Like, or does this exclude groups of people? So it's important to us as we develop sort of AI capabilities that fairness is considered reliability and safety you know is this reliable um is this going to be stable um privacy and security how is information gathered by whom for what purpose um how is it stored how is it accessed how is it disposed who can see it and who can't see it so privacy and security matter greatly to us and one of our uh, ai principles is inclusiveness like can everybody access this or does this unfairly limit the access to certain groups of people i think one of the exciting things about generative ai right now is that it's democratized access to this reasoning engine to everybody before november last year it certainly existed but it existed for few people with expensive computers and PhDs in research areas. Now it's on everybody's cell phone and everybody's laptop. The last couple of principles of ours are around transparency, making sure that everybody understands what it is they're using, what are the guardrails in place, uh, and there's a massive one for us around accountability. So when Microsoft develops tools which we build into our own products or their new products or their tools which other people, other partners are using of ours in order to superpower their solutions, fairness, reliability, safety, privacy, security, inclusivity, transparency and accountability. You know, these are the guardrails that honestly everybody needs to have in place as they start adopting these tools uh, in order to minimise any likely harm. Because in education, you're, you're dealing with highly sensitive student information all of the time. And we know from the explosion over the last number of years of cyber attacks on education institutions, that education is seen as a soft target. Um, so any tools which gather, use student data, student information, you know, need to be approached thoughtfully and cautiously. All right. <clears throat> Mark, you know, AI is very powerful, especially now when the generative AI is there rolling out across the world. It is very amazing thing, but questions, will Excuse me. Will the AI replace a human teacher in the classroom? That is the way how we should use the AI in the classroom? Or we should go like with the hybrid model, human teacher plus AI as an assistance tool. So what is the balanced approach? Yeah. And by the two ways. One in the classroom when there is a teacher and one wh when the student is using at its own, at his or her home. Yeah, no, great questions. I guess if we situate that question against the current reality globally, which is there is a massive supply and demand challenge for in education. 
Um, I know of only a few education systems globally at the moment who don't have a crisis shortage of skilled teachers and a predicted um, continuation of challenge to find enough teachers. So we've got this backdrop of um, a supply demand tension around educators. I think, you know, to, to your question around, you know, this concern of, uh, you know, could generative AI and, and these kinds of advanced technologies replace teachers? Um, I think the role of the teacher is amplified here. You know, the I think the, the key message here is, uh, you know, we need to emphasise the human in the loop and humans need to excel and have the time to excel at the things that AI can't do. Um, so building relationships is fundamental to education. Learning is a social process. It's best done together. And when we've interviewed students across the globe for Microsoft's paper, The Class of 2030 and Life Ready Learning, one of the findings that came across uh, out of every country and every student was that the students didn't want their learning to be automated. They didn't want their learning to be delivered just on a screen. They did want autonomy. They wanted teachers who knew them and how they learn, who know their curriculum and how they teach. And tools like generative AI are providing us with a disruption and an opportunity to think about if we want to hyper-personalise student learning, if we want to close feedback loops, if we want to free up educators to be able to focus on what matters most, then we can lever these tools to do good. A, a recent study conducted by McKinsey and Company noted, not surprisingly to any educator, that about 45 to 50% of a teacher's time was not spent teaching. It's spent curating and creating teaching resources. It's spent communicating and writing. It's spent reading and sense making from documents. A lot of that can be outsourced to AI. I mean, you could have AI do that first draft of that school newsletter, that first draft of that class newsletter. A busy teacher can give AI a 70 page document that's come out on, I don't know, whatever, uh, new research insights into the science of reading and can pop that into generative AI and say, please provide a 10 word summary and it will do it. We can save teachers a vast amount of time. And when you ask teachers, what do they want to do with that time? They never say, I want to sit down and have a cup of coffee. They say, I want to personalise learning for my students more. I want to build deeper relationships. I want to understand more the complexities being faced by my students and help them. That's what teachers want, right? And um, so the exciting opportunity here for generative AI is to shift the time that teachers spend on curating, creating and communicating, outsource that to AI to have a crack at the first draft, not to do it, not to take it over, but do that first draft. The AI also has the opportunity, as I explained with Reading Coach, Reading Progress example, and that's one of many examples of giving students that individualized tutoring and support. New York City is rolling out as part of um, you know, as part of the, the, the whole uh, public education, um, a, a chatbot which is powered by Microsoft's AI. And it's fielding questions and it, triaging requests coming into the department. And already they were indicating about 30% um, of the questions coming in were now being managed and resolved by the, the, the chatbot. Was, so they're saving this time which gives them more time, more money, more flexibility to focus on the things that matter most. And I think that's the exciting opportunity here is that teachers and students can focus on the things that matter most. For the teachers, it's about building relationships and ensuring that learners have got voice and choice and agency in their classrooms. And for the students, 
they can focus on developing higher order skills, um, developing, you know, much more um, useful and transferable future ready skills than just recalling content. All right. Uh, Mark, you know, one concern is that uh, AI might perpetuate biases present in data. How can we mitigate bias in AI driven educational tools and content? You know, and you know, it could be both from the side of the engineers who programmed AI large language models and AI models. Mm -hmm. And it could also be, uh, you know, some kind of machine learning that is automatically creating some kind of bias. Yeah, yeah, good, uh, good questions. And I, I flagged that before um, around, you know, the, the one of the risk factors is around algorithmic bias, or, you know, depending to your point on the, the you know, the language data sets that the algorithms are trained on can perpetuate a bias. Again, that's why people who are developing um, AI power tools need to have a clear set of principles like we do around fairness and inclusivity and accountability and transparency. They've got to be in place. Another part of the answer to your, uh, you know, to this challenge is we need to ensure that Students who will be the prompt engineers of the future and the AI engineers of the future, we need to ensure that that workforce is diverse and representative. This is why it's absolutely critical that all young people have opportunity to engage early in computer science and develop an interest and a passion for computer science that pulls them through into higher education, into careers, because we need a diverse and representative workforce who are in the business of training models, developing models, um, and ideating on the next wave of sort of intelligent technologies. You know, it's why, you know, Microsoft invests time in developing computer science curriculum in industry certifications, offering things, everything from Minecraft education where young students can learn how to code with block coding and then can lead into, you know, Python and C Sharp and pull that through. We just need to make sure that the future workforce who are developing the tools of the future represent broad humanity and the diversity of human experience. And the other bit I would say is all of us in education, teachers, principals, need to be um, skilled up and understanding, not just using, but understanding the very things that you've just talked about. One of the things that we Microsoft released at ISTE was a free uh, course, brand new course, AI for Educators. I can share the link afterwards. It's one hour, it's nine modules, it's aligned to ISTE standards but it's also aligned to the UNESCO standards for educators. And what this does is it, it enables educators, teachers, school leaders, anybody working in schools to understand uh, what large language models are and how they work. Um, they get to understand the ethics of AI. They get to understand generative AI that we've been talking about, but situate that in a broader sort of AI um, landscape. So they'll also have a chance to use the tools like we've talked about here and, and experience how AI can be used to reduce workload, increase learner engagement, how it can help learning be more accessible, more inclusive. But importantly, to your point, understand what are the risks and challenges here because unless people are conscious of those then the risk is that they'll be accepting of the responses they receive from a system and this is where critical thinking you know on the human side is a really important skill uh, it's an important skill for young people to develop to 
be able to critically review um, what any form of generative AI is producing and ask questions about it. Like, is this representative? Who is missing here? How do I know that this is valid? How do I know that this is being drawn from a reputable source? You know, those sorts of questions, that kind of critical thinking will be fundamental um, for success in the future. Being able to create effective prompts actually requires a lot of heavy duty, higher order thinking. Being able to critically review and analyze the output from any form of generative AI in order to make a judgment about whether this is accurate, authoritative, inclusive, or bias detection. But I guess these are the 22nd century skills that we need to be tuning into. All right. Uh, Mark, since, you know, AI is there to help the teachers, generative AI tools are there to help the teachers. Now, keeping in view the role of technology and, and the use of technology, how do you see the role of a teacher now with the use of technology? I mean, many things are being automated on the side of teacher and on the side of learner as well. So what do you suggest to a teacher to be a good teacher by using AI tools? Yeah, good. You know, I would define a teacher as an expert in learning design. Okay, this is what a teacher is. A teacher is an expert in learning design. And as an expert in learning design, we, and I speak on behalf of my profession of educators, we choose and use the best tools to get the best job done at that moment in time. Sometimes that involves opening up a laptop. Sometimes it involves intentionally putting one away. Sometimes it will involve um, designing learning where the students have been put into groups of three, but the fourth member of their group is a, is a AI uh, chatbot who's going to be a, a part of their group and their group task moving forwards and they're working together, the four of them. This is, you know, the cusp of, you know, real human computer collaboration that we're seeing. But to go back to what I said at the start, the role of the teacher here is clear. The teacher is the expert in learning design. That's what they've studied to do. They understand about student development, cognitive development, social development, moral ethical development. They understand what the priorities are for their education system, their curriculum priorities, content, skills, dispositions. Then the expert in learning design, the teacher, weaves those together. That's where they make the magic. It's where the science of learning and the art of teaching come together in the hands of that teacher in that classroom who knows their learners and how they learn, who knows their curriculum and how to teach. And when you meet those teachers and they're everywhere and they talk about generative AI, they're pulling the bits in and they're weaving them into their learning design because they know that learning is social, is immersive, is connected to purpose, is connected to passion, involves students being empowered with voices and choices and agency to go and create new content themselves. So, you know, I'm kind of excited for the profession because I think, you know, this is a pivotal moment where a incredibly powerful tool has been made available to everybody and providing we keep in mind the safeguards and we keep in mind what our role is as experts in learning design, then I don't I don't see that, you know, a robot is coming to take your job in the classroom happening very soon. But I do think we'll see, and we are seeing the whisper of new models emerging, um, new approaches emerging for how learning is designed. And part of that is fueled by but the potential of generative AI, part of that is the legacy of what's happened over the last two, three years with a 
sudden push globally to remote learning and an explosion of renewed focus on hybrid models, remote models and blended models of learning. All right. Uh, Mark, how teachers can make the learning personalized and customized for the learners? What could be the strategy by using these generative AI tools and AI tools? Yeah, and I think this is probably where it's really exciting around this kind of concept of hyper-personalized learning, um, giving the students access to feedback, giving them access to tools which can help them, you know, create an outline for a story, uh, whereas they might be stuck and struggling with that. Uh, before. So I think one way is companies like Microsoft folding generative AI tools within their existing products. So the tools that students are already using, they're now finding additional functionality sitting within those, which are either AI or generative AI. Example would be something as simple as dictate in Word. You know, for a student who, let's say, their their mind runs faster than their hand can write or they can type, um, they're struggling to get a piece of writing out, you know, the click of a button, they can just dictate their entire story, peers on the screen. That's also using AI, but it's not a generative tool. It's not generating the content for them, but it is using a neural network to transcribe what it hears and as the student is dictating you'll notice that it's editing along the way it'll edit out the ums and ahs and uh, if they repeat a word it, so it is sense making along the way that's awesome in itself but then think about this the student at a click of a button can drop that text into immersive reader and have it read back read back in 40 languages. They can access an on-screen dictionary. They can listen to their own writing and start to edit it along the way. Again, this is putting control in the hands of the learner. The learner's in control here. This is where learning becomes personal. It's not just about getting an individual quiz, right, or getting a, um, a piece of content delivered to you that you can listen and rewind and listen again but personalized learning is also about student agency it's about putting in the hands of the learners the tools that they can use to adjust the pace and the the type of content that they're receiving and built into most of our microsoft products are features which put control in the hands of the learners. Example would be, you know, Minecraft. Lots of kids love that. Let's say you're an English language learner. A lot of the instructions and information are in text. You can click and translate that from Spanish into English. You can click and listen to it in the language that you choose. You know, this gives every kid the best seat in the house potentially, and that's that's at the heart of personalised learning is being able for the students in a non-stigmatising way to get the support that they need. And that's not just for students who are struggling, but students who are very advanced can also make use of exactly the same tools to be able to understand more advanced content, to be able to produce more complex pieces of work Right. Uh, Mark, AI technologies can produce vast amount of data. How educators and institutions effectively use this data to improve teaching and learning outcomes, including also how, gov how government you can use that data to improve the education sector? Yeah, sure. And, and I can answer some of that, that part of the question. Um, you know, one of the things that happened over the last couple of years, certainly, if we just go back even before this explosion and interest in AI, as, you know, as schools across the globe suddenly shifted to remote learning, one of the flip sides was a vast amount of additional information was generated. You know, if you like, the digital footprint 
of all of the schools increased exponentially. And, and some were challenged to try to find ways to find the intelligence inside of the data um, because there was so much there. What we have inside of uh, Microsoft Teams, which is, is free for, uh, for education, is an analytics engine called insights and what insights does is just what it says is it takes all of that data and uses ai not generative ai but it uses ai so data analysis and synthesizing and summarization um, to pull out highlights from the data back to the teachers and back to the principals so within a dashboard what as a teacher you can see is across all of my students, you know, uh, how they're engaging, where they're logged on, what they're using, what they've submitted, grades, um, assignment submissions, the reading example I gave you, so the students reading progress, um, speaker progress, all of that data is a visual. So it's all available for teachers to look at over time. Plus also what the system does is it pulls out things called spotlights. So when it notices a variance in the data, it pulls out a spotlight card to highlight that for the busy teacher who may not have noticed that, you know, um, that Mark's, uh, you know, has been consistently late in submitting an assignment or he was having a, that generally the, the class was, you know, had, was, um, you know, 30% of the students in the class had failed to submit an assignment. And that might act as a prompt again for the teacher in the, the loop, the teacher to take some action to find out why. Another really interesting thing to comment on data is around social and emotional self-reported well-being data. Really critical, right? Especially over the last couple of years where prior to COVID, uh, student mental health globally was a massive issue with sort of one in five students with a identified sort of a mental health challenge um, and then of course since COVID's finished and we've moved back to something resembling um, sort of a post-COVID education model um, students have been feeling more overwhelmed and less supported um, based upon recent research so sitting inside of Microsoft Teams where that insights analytic engine is is another tool a free tool and it's called reflect and this tool collects subjective well-being data because emotions are data points as well. And emotions are the gatekeeper to cognition, motivation, and attention. Like they're, they're the gatekeeper for learning and flourishing in learning. So we have this tool built inside of Microsoft Teams that collects that information also. It remains at the school Microsoft doesn't have access to that information. But think about this, as a teacher or principal, you've got all of this information about how students are going with their schoolwork, you know, how they're progressing, how they're participating, what they're submitting, how well they're reading, all of that data is there. Now you've got a heartbeat of how the student is feeling. Not only that, how the whole class is feeling. You've got that information at your fingertips, not waiting until the end of a term or the end of a year for a survey, but you've got that information live. And as a busy teacher or principal, it means that you can pivot. It means that you can make a change, that you can adjust on the fly, or you can look at that data and say, you know, why is it that some classrooms are feeling great and some aren't feeling great you know what is it or why is this school or not that school um you know reporting more positive emotions and you can take action from that so as a little example insights the analytic engine built inside of microsoft teams is one example of a way that we're helping educators and schools and systems make sense of all of this information by pulling it into a visual dashboard and then providing some machine learning insights from that data to allow the human to take action. All right. Uh, 
much you know when we talk about the learning models you know technology has really disrupted this learning and teaching model right now when we talk on the learning and teaching models you know there is there was on campus model then there was online model and in online there is recorded online model live online model and yeah. now there are ai chatbots too so now keeping in view all these things what do you think could be the best learning model today especially for the university students and what for the school students yeah no worries i think one of the terms that i hear a lot especially in higher education discussions is around sort of hyper flex models and i guess i guess it, I, I, I kind of like that because it, it shifts it shifts kind of the labeling away from you know the the place and time which is what a lot of the conversations are when people talk about blended and remote and face to face and um you know all these different sorts of models you know at the end of the day we're just talking about learning um and you know hyperflex is not a bad example too um highly adaptable learning models which best meet the needs of the learners um you know as i said at the start learning is a social process it's best done together and teaching is not just transmission okay so teaching is as i said teaching is about the expert in the learning design understanding the learner needs and how they learn best understanding their curriculum and understanding what are the tools that they have available the pedagogical tools the technology tools and the other tools that they have available to design the best learning experience for their students so the answer is there isn't clearly just one because all learning is situated in a culture and a context and a resource constraint um, certainly what i'm seeing uh, the promising models are those which are well they're hyperflex they're a combination of all of these where students have got some control over the pacing and the placing of learning so should they need to be picking up online live online non live asynchronous and synchronous should they need to be face to face one to one with a lecturer should they need to be in small group scenarios with a lecturer small group scenarios student directed with or without maybe an ai assistant working with those it can be a mix of all of those and what we're seeing at the moment around the globe are people experimenting and exploring around the edges of what these hyperflex models could look like and it also comes to you know it comes with challenges right when i've been interviewing educators um you know the challenges are around current assessment um practices and you know we need i've heard the comment we need to rethink you know we need to rethink what we're assessing and how and yet you know schools as we know have got constraints we've got mandatory state based assessments or national based assessments which might be measuring on a certain number of indicators which may not necessarily these days line up with what education needs to be pivoting towards to deliver which feels to be much more skill based and higher order thinking oriented than content recall um you know as it was which is kind of easy to assess i know this or i don't know this whereas you know skill based is actually more challenging because you're looking at portfolio learning or you're looking at um you know the learning being judged by a panel of experts from within the school and outside of the school making judgments around a student's presentation of demonstration of application of learning not just knowledge of content so you know there are 
there are lots of emerging models. I think what we've been provided with over the last two years with both remote learning as a result of COVID and the explosion of generative AI, just think about those two alone. That is like education being placed in a Hadron Collider and decades and decades of kind of a stagnated innovation has rapidly been accelerated, right? And it's been shot around the Hadron Collider. Um, and at the moment, we're starting to see, you know, what are the possibilities? What are some of the what are some of the persistent changes from remote learning that are now part of practice in schools? And as people start to explore and experiment on the edges of the potential of generative AI to provide hyper-personalized learning, closed feedback loops, support teachers in learning design, you know, we're going to see exciting new models that we as yet to imagine. One thing I would say is education has always been in a state of disruption. It's always been affected by what the broader economic and social settings um, have had as agendas has always impacted education. And we're in a position now which is no different. The only difference really is the acceleration of the new innovations. All right, Mark, it will be the last question. In fact, uh... I mean, how do you see the peak of, I mean, how do you imagine the perfect education model with the help of AI? I mean, that really fascinates you. How do you see the future of education? Yeah. Um, so how I see the future of education, the future of education is open world, right? So knowledge opportunities, experiences flow in and out, you know, schools become porous. Um, the future of learning is profoundly social. You know, that is part of our unique humanness. Um, so, you know, learning as a social activity done together. Um, so open world, um, socially embedded, um, amplified by technology, um, built around mastery and skilling. Doesn't matter how many times or how long it takes you to master a skill or a topic. All that matters is that you master or develop that skill around that topic. So I see the, the future of learning of picking up, you know, certainly those elements around uh, high priority on student agency, mastery, hyper personalization open open world and socially embedded you know and that's a very humanistic kind of view of the future of learning and all of those elements are amplified and extended by technology and and as again as an educator i look at that and i would nod my head and go yeah that is the future of education socially embedded mastery focused emphasizing student agency open world like yeah that's what we should be doing because make no mistake um educators we are the architects of the future that's what an educator is an educator is an architect of the future because our future society the world that we want to live in our preferred future it's being built in classrooms around the globe every day. So we just need to be thinking about what kind of world do we want to live in? And educators, thank you who are listening. You are the architects of that future. We want a creative, collaborative, calm, civic oriented future where everybody has voice, everybody has choice. Uh, and everybody has agency to pursue passion and purpose and lead flourishing lives. I mean, that's that's a pretty cool thing. But that's what we do in schools, right? We architect future societies. All right, Mark, really, thank you so much. And trust me, it was really insightful talking to you on this topic. And in the last, I would request you to give uh, 
any message, any advice to my audience, you know, which are educators, business community, university students and teachers, any message that could inspire them or change their life? Yeah, I think, I think my message would be the future is so bright, you're going to need to wear your sunglasses. As long as we constantly keep in mind our unique human capabilities and capacities and we collectively lean in to explore possibilities that emerging technologies can help every kid have the best seat in the house to humanise learning with technology, not just digitise content, but humanise learning, then I think things are going to be great.